God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What's the, the newest thing that you own? Or maybe more broadly, just the newest change in your life recently? This is one of those things where you can say almost anything. Maybe you have a new car, a new phone, or maybe there's been a new child or a new grandchild born into the family. Again, the, the list goes on and on. And generally speaking, any, anything new is a good thing. There can be bad new things, of course, but when we think new, we usually think that's going to be good for me, for us. Except there's one problem with every new thing. You know what it is. It just doesn't stay new. The second you drive that new car off the lot, yeah, you can call it new, but the price, the value, and you hold that, that phone in your hand or that, that child in your arms technically for more than one second, they're no longer new. They're second older than they used to be. They're getting older. They're aging. On that, that new car, on that new phone, on that new child, the clock has already started ticking down. So this opens up a big door of problems for us in our life, doesn't it? Because we always like new things, and we want these new things to be good for us, whether it's a person or a thing or an experience, they all have that same big problem, they just don't last. Every good thing, it seems, just starts to disappear into to nothingness. Every new thing vanishes to death, to decay. And then with them go all of our hopes and dreams that here this new thing was going to be something better and brighter and greater good for us. And so before you just start to give up on this whole day, this whole life, and give in to all your despairs thinking like this, hold on for a second. Because there's another meaning to that word new. It doesn't just mean that something is new in time, but new in quality or kind. That is, we have something new here that we never have. We never knew, we never experienced before. For example, when someone loses like a lot of weight, what, what might you say to them? You're a new person, but not any younger. But there is something new here that wasn't there before. If we could go back in time and get our great, 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 great grandparents from hundreds, thousands of years ago, bring them to right now, what might they say? They'd see our planes and our cars, our phones, our clothes, they'd say, well, that's new. You might object. Now this whole thing, these clothes, they're a few years old. Planes, cars, phones, we've had them around for decades. But it is new to them. Where this is all going is simply this. The Bible has a lot to say about being new and new things. We hear it in Isaiah 65, a new heavens, a new earth, and Revelation 21, where our sermon theme comes from. The Lord seated on his throne says, I am making everything. New. And if we thought just new in time, we might have picked, well, Lord, that sounds nice, but every new thing in this life, in our experience, it just starts getting older. So we do well to pay attention to what God is saying here when he says, I make everything new. He's saying, I'm going to do something for you, the likes of which you couldn't even have begun to dream of. Except it's right here in his word for us. Today we get that privilege to just kind of sit back and, and soak in and enjoy the new things God has promised to us in Christ, that he will make a new world, a new place, and a new you. The best is still to come. God wrote all this. He showed us all this through his prophet Isaiah. He wrote that monumental book of prophecies, 66 chapters. So we're right here at the end of chapter 65. And there's a lot in Isaiah and these other prophets that, that warns and gives judgments and punishments against the people of Judah and Jerusalem and, and all unbelievers ever who stand against God and his word. But here today we hear those simple words of hope and comfort and salvation that aren't just for the people in Isaiah's day, for the people of Jerusalem that he talks about here, but for all believers ever, including us. And here's what your God says to you. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, 
normally come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. So did you hear what God says to you and about you over and over again? Glad. Rejoice. Delight. The joy. God is saying that you are his joy. Can you believe that? People like you and me, we are God's joy. Now, now God's not oblivious. He knows who you are in your sins. He knows everything. He knows more than you know about yourself. He knows even more than we could ever begin to imagine since he was there at the very beginning when Adam and Eve fell into sin. And ever since, all the evil, all the pain, all the sadness and grief, the suffering, the sickness, the death, the hatred, all of it has its root going back to us and our sins. This curse we have brought upon this entire world. And for all that we try to do to make a new and better world, we can't create anything new and good. We can only destroy whatever we try to do. So God simply must step in and say, fine, then I will make a new heavens and a new earth. He is saying that one day his son, Jesus Christ, will come back to this world and make a new world for us, his new people. We are his joy. Again, you have to stop and just think about that. Can you really believe that? I mean, God says it so, so we must believe it. But it's almost beyond our understanding. How could we be God's delight and gladness and joy? Well, of course, it's not you or me. It's always and only because of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. It's because of Jesus that God can say, you are my joy. Because Jesus, he put that cross in his sights, and he said, for the joy set before me, I will endure that cross. I will despise all its shame, even death and hell, so I can save it's almost as if Jesus said to his father, Father, you know, I know what they've done. You know what they've done. They have ruined themselves. They have corrupted your good creation. But Father, send me so I can take their place and justify them before you. Father, send me so I can recreate them in my image so you will love them as you love me. Father, send me to turn them from their sins and in the newness of faith, they will love and trust in you alone. Father, send me, Jesus said, so I can make everything new. And that's what Jesus has done. That's what Jesus will do. You are God's eternal joy. You can never say that or hear it enough. You are God's eternal joy because of Christ alone, your Savior. And even now, what we'll enjoy in this future new heaven and new earth, we get to enjoy it and in part even now when we know that our Savior Jesus, he's right there at the Father's side, pleading and interceding for us, saying again, Father, have mercy on my people, your people. Father, remove their tears with my love. Let the sound of weeping and of crying be heard in them, my people, no more. That's why we can say it just almost doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't matter how far gone you think you are, or someone else. Doesn't matter how deeply you've fallen into despair now or in the present, or maybe you will one day in the future, doesn't matter. How evil our world, our country, our society is becoming, it doesn't matter how wickedly you have sinned. Because of this joy of Jesus, has the power to just completely break all the power of the devil and death and sin and despair and this gladness of God in you because of Christ that fills you with new hope every day. As Paul once said, you are a new creation, something you never were before, never could have dreamed of, but here you really are. You are God's child. The old is gone. And the new you has come. The former things not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. You are God's eternal joy. You are a new creation in Christ. Just as God takes delight and joy in you, then let's turn now to take joy and delight, as he says, in what he will create. This new heavens, this new earth, this new world for us. As we get to this next part of that bottom paragraph in Isaiah 65 on page 1, it 
does admittedly get a little bit trickier to interpret this. Because if you heard it read earlier, maybe you were puzzled. Well, when is this all going to happen, or is it already happening? Is this a time now or not yet? A time in this life or a time in the life to come? Because on the one hand, these verses sure sound like a future new heavens and new earth God is planning for us. When he says, never again will an infant die. And, and always, everyone will live out all of their years. But then on the other hand, it, it kind of sounds like right now, because he does talk about people having children. Isaiah talks about people dying at 100 or before 100, and, and yet our, our Savior in Luke 20 today, he said, well, that resurrection age, my people will be like the angels. They won't marry, so they won't have kids, and they're not going to die. So what's going on? Maybe the simplest, best, easiest thing is to just say that God so much wants you to know what your eternal life in this new heaven and new earth is going to be like. He wants it so badly for you that he's not going to wait until you get there to tell you what it's like. He's going to tell you right here, right now, that so there's a catch in our lowly sinfulness. We just can't grasp what that really will be like. So he uses language from this life, pictures from this world, to describe the life of the world to come. For example, can you really fathom what it means that in the new heaven and new earth there will be no death? I mean, you can say it, you just did. You get the concept, you confess it in the, the creed every every week, the resurrection and the eternal life to come. But can you really say, oh, I know what that's like, there to be no death? But God wants you to get as close as he can, so he helps us, and he says here, okay, I'll tell you what it's not going to be like. Never again will one of your babies die. Never again will any of you die. Never again will a young man or a young woman die in the prime of her life or his life. <laughs> or, or let's say hypothetically, what if there were death in this new creation? Even then, it would be like the days of Adam and Noah when people lived 900 plus years. And if someone were or could die at the age of 100, we'd say, well, she died young. And if someone died before 100, we would say, well, he must have been cursed. He didn't even make it to 100. These aren't predictions of what it will precisely be like. They're, they're comparisons to help us get as close as we can. So with all that being said, we get to the real point here that God has made. Simply telling us, you, my children, my believers, you will have total security. You'll have absolutely nothing to fear. Unlike right now. Because think of all the things we, we tend to be afraid of in this life. We ask those questions. When am I going to die? When are my children going to die? Did I bring children into this world? Just so they could live in a terrible, miserable world and be doomed to misfortune. And everything I've worked so hard for. What's the point? Just going to die and it's all going to be gone one day. Or even in this life, someone comes and steals it from me, takes all my hard work, and enjoys the fruits of my labor. Why? And it's not just us, but for thousands of years since the beginning, believers have been suffering as they watch their children their loved ones die. Believers have been suffering as they've been cheated and robbed and accused and humiliated and despised again and again. And here God is simply saying, I see it. I know it. And here's what I'm going to do about it. I am making for you a new world where that will never, ever happen again. A new world where the devil and death and hell and and crying and pain, and everything even close to that will be gone forever. As he says in 2 Peter 3, it will be the home of righteousness. All wrongs will be made right. Everything will be good and perfect in God's sight for us. So yes, right now, it's true. In a sense, you don't have that total security. Because you're always, you're always being attacked by the devil and the world in your own sinful flesh. But you do have security in Christ. You have the, the one thing you need, the weapon, the defense, to drive back all your enemies all the time. And that is these words you hear today. 
never again. No more, no longer, forever. When God says, you are my people, my chosen ones, you are a people blessed by the Lord, you can say to the devil, stop cursing me with all your accusations. I am blessed by the Lord. You can say to this world, you will one day never be able to take anything from me again. You can say to them, yeah, I might die, but the day will come when I will never die again. joy that God has for you in Christ, that total security, he promises to come and gives you incredible peace. And we don't go along with the rest of the world or our own sinful hearts and say, well, that must mean, peace means I get everything I want, everything goes my way. Because peace in the Bible is much bigger than just you, yourself, getting everything you want. Even though by God's grace, his peace includes even you and me. When you hear that word, peace, then, it includes you, but it's always bigger. It's all of God's work, all of God's plans and purposes coming together finally in Christ our Lord. Not just for us, but for this whole created universe. Because again, you remember what God said, what happened at the beginning. When we fell into sin, it didn't just ruin human beings. It ruined all of God's good creation. From mice to mountains and plants to planets, you see death everywhere you look. And that's because of us and our sin. So it was the joy and determination of Jesus Christ when he came in, in becoming a man and living, dying, rising, ascending into heaven again, ruling all things. It was his joy, delight, and determination to say, Father, here I am, and I am going to make everything new. I will come again on that last day. I will restore this universe. I will recreate heaven and earth. I will reconcile all things in this creation to you, my God, my Lord. The peace of my blood shed on the cross. Jesus is coming again to bring peace to you, this whole world. So we can, if we want, we can debate, maybe later, if you want to. We can debate whether lions and lambs and wolves and oxen are literally going to graze together in this new eternal world. Maybe it's just a picture of how perfect our peace will be. That's the point. That our God has in store for us as resurrected people and for this, his recreated universe, an incredible peace. And I don't just mean incredible as in awesome, really cool incredible. It is that. I mean incredible in what that word actually means, beyond belief. As what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. You could not dream up this sort of thing unless God had said it clearly to us in his word. And we couldn't have dared to believe it would be true unless God had promised it to so. This incredible harmony, he says, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. We just cannot even begin to imagine that in this life. And he promises never again in the life to come will there be anything to get between you and me. None of that busyness or laziness of ours, our worries, our distractions, our fears, the, the phone ringing, the cars beeping, the interrupted thoughts, none of that will get in between God speaking to us and us speaking to him. That, that barrier of sin will be utterly removed. But it gets more incredible still because the, he says the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Again, can you imagine this? A world where we're going to talk about death and the devil and despair, just like we talk about now, the set players, record players, landlines, so maybe some of us. But all of us, how we talk about a telegram or a horse and buggy carriage, we'll say, oh, is that a thing? Death? Oh, you know, I, I guess maybe 10,000 years ago I died of the resurrection and all. The devil, you know, for these last 10 million years, I have forgotten he even ever existed until you mentioned his name just now. And, and a spare don't come on. How could that ever happen when here we have our Lord Jesus Christ before us in the flesh? We see his face every day. He has written his name on our foreheads. He is our life, our hope, our strength, our love. How could you ever conceive of an idea like despair, like giving up hope, when he never leaves us and we never leave him? Now that is incredible. And maybe it won't happen exactly the way I just said it, but you get the perfect picture. That Jesus will be with us and we will be with him. It will be an incredible peace. Yet 
everything new. In, in both senses of new that we've been talking about today. When he comes again, he will make a new world that, as we said, we just couldn't begin to imagine, but, but here it is in these words. And it will be new in that it will never get old. It will never die. It will never, ever go away for all eternity. So until that new day comes, what are you and I, what are we to do? Well, maybe think of yourselves like watchmen on the walls of a city during the night. What are they doing? They're, they're waiting, and they're working at various tasks that they've been given, but of course, they're, they're watching, not just to see if any trouble is coming their way, they're watching for that first break of daylight so they can finally have a break, finally have peace and rest. And that's you and me right now. Like watchmen, we are... We are waiting for that last day to come. We are working at whatever God has given us to do as, as parents or pastors or teachers or, or children or spouses or siblings, citizens, friends, workers, all of it. We are working at what God has given us to do. But you're also watching. You're watching for that break of dawn. And in fact, it's already broken. Once that baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And with every miracle and teaching, with his cross and with his empty tomb, he broke all the power of the devil. With every word of God that you and I and anyone in this world hears and believes, the light of Christ breaks the darkness in our life and in this world. So like watchmen in the night, simply wait, keep working, but of course never stop doing this in prayer and in longing watch for the Son of Righteousness to rise with healing in His wings, for Jesus to call you out of the grave, for His powerful world's word to remake this whole world, and finally, forever and for good, He will.